This episode is sponsored by Audible. One of the most disappointing moments in my life was when I realized that as cool as they look, giant robots just are not practical war engines. Or are they? So today we are taking another look at how warfare might adjust to the future as we develop better technology and shift into other battlegrounds like outer space, cyberspace, virtual reality, or even the human mind. The human mind, of course, has always been the principal battleground and origin of all these changing battlefield landscapes, and when hypothetical technologies show up in our fiction and daydreams they are not always well bounded by pragmatism and hard science. Giant robots that people can pilot, or exoskeletons and power armor we can don, are two such examples, and also great examples of how a storyteller's medium impacts what stories they can tell. Fundamentally, giant humanoid war machines just look awesome, so they mostly appear in fiction we can see, initially in comic books and graphic novels rather than traditional text-only novels. When they showed up later in TV and film, It was first mostly in animation like the Gundam franchise, where they weren't so technically difficult and expensive to film and didn't still come out looking clumsy and cheap. Part of the reason they tended to be humanoid in non-animated live action shows was because you could make your robots and monsters giant by scaling down sets around actors in costume. Some early examples like Godzilla and Mechagodzilla showed that you don't have to stick too closely to humanoid form even for costumes but deviating from it very much introduces budget and filming problems, just like earlier aliens in science fiction who always look like people with some minor makeup or prosthetics on, this often challenged people's feeling of realism. Devoted fans could argue that maybe a humanoid shape would be a common one to evolve to, convergent evolution to a practical form, but that is rather dubious. However, for giant robots, the in-story argument for them is generally a bit more well-reasoned and more tied into their success with audiences. While it's true that the humanoid form is not really ideal for combat, especially scaled up larger in size and deployed in conflicts with ranged weapons, the one thing they have going for them is that the human form is very easy for humans to control. And since combat is generally high speed and reflexive, and battlefields are full of distractions, it does behoove you to use a shape folks are already used to manipulating at high speed, reflexively, and while distracted. These need not be a close parallel to a human shape, shows like Exosquad generally limited the basic form to humanoid for easy natural control, but didn't stick to that too closely and even skipped it entirely sometimes. From an entertainment angle of course, it's also easier for us to relate to and project ourselves into a giant humanoid robot that evokes the image of a classic knight or samurai, and that implies something elite and special deployed singly or in small groups, rather than huge infantry battalions marching around together in lockstep formation. Of course we don't deploy forces in large formations anymore either, Most modern military units rarely assemble into a battalion-sized formation, and when they do it's usually for something ceremonial. Company-sized units of about a hundred troops usually do form up two or three times a day, but not for combat, just headcounts, assignments, news, and updates. Since the first rule of warfare is not to be an easy target and give your enemies high impact, low risk investments for their ordnance, standing around or even moving around in a big tight formation isn't a good idea. Phalanxes and shield walls made sense in the past, but we've two critical paradigm shifts that generally make it a bad policy nowadays, super powerful long range guns and high volume but complex industrial production of gear. Offensive weaponry is almost universally very powerful and long range, and where it isn't it's because it's calibrated to maximize something else, like mobility, accuracy, endurance, and duration of an infantryman in combat. In general, a bullet carried by a soldier doesn't need to be any more potent than is necessary to kill an enemy soldier, adding more mass or propellant to the bullet, or making his machine gun fire more rapidly might seem like improvements 
but they reduce the number of rounds a soldier can carry, make him burn up his ammo more quickly, and introduces a lot more recoil. Despite what movies and TV show, bullets actually don't have much momentum behind them, indeed the person firing it absorbs slightly more momentum than the target because the bullet loses some passing through the air. Planes, tanks, and armored vehicles can mount far higher powered anti-personnel weapons because they can absorb the greater recoil and also carry all that additional weight of ammo. They can also carry the weight of protective armor. Armor's heavy and somewhat awkward, though less than folks tend to think, even the old steel stuff from centuries ago. Mostly it's very exhausting to wear. All that weight wears you down and it traps heat and moisture inside too. I'd often get a cloud of steam coming off me when I took mine off after missions, and you always breathe a sigh of relief when you can take it off. If you can recall the feeling of stepping into a climate controlled building after being outside on a hot muggy day, multiply that sense of relief by 10. And the same is true of pretty much all protective gear. Humans are very good at sweating for heat dissipation. It's what let us be such good persistence predators, jog for hours at a time, and run that massive supercomputer on top of our shoulders. Be it body armor, sports gear, or spacesuits, they all turn into exhausting sweatboxes, with firefighting gear possibly being the worst, as it's an awful lot of gear that you wear during heavy exertion in a very hot environment. All of which makes us think it would be a great idea to have some sort of protective gear that was able to carry its own weight, though the ability to cool itself and deal with moisture is probably just as important and rarely gets mentioned much in these discussions. We are pretty much there in terms of technology able to add strength smoothly in tandem with a person's own motions, which is a lot harder than just slapping hydraulic pistons on but modern computing and miniaturization has improved enough to allow that. Ditto, it's not really hard to do the cooling and dehumidifying. The issue is power, and we discuss that more in portable power and with armor specifically in planetary invasions, so we'll mostly bypass that today. The other issue, of course, is cost, and that is the second of those paradigm shifts I mentioned a couple minutes ago. In olden days, while many civilizations did have military training incorporated into daily life, like practicing archery or riding horses, armies often rounded up every able-bodied person they could get, gave them a weapon and a little training, and marched them off. This was another reason for wanting big formations besides normal battlefield advantage, most of the folks in them weren't exactly professionals, so grouping everyone together helped with training, transport, communication, coordinating, and resisting the urge to panic and run off to find a less dangerous vocation. But quantity has a quality all its own, and of course that's the first rule of warfare, always outnumber your opponent. As we get into more modern times, industrial era and beyond, there's usually a much larger investment in training folks before they can be useful in war or peace. A culture where everyone owned a bow or rifle for hunting can convert those folks into reasonably effective archers or riflemen fairly easily, but we are more complex and specialized, so we can't convert folks into troops as quickly. We do have some modern universal tasks, like driving or using a keyboard, but even a tracked vehicle like a tank isn't very like driving a car and piloting a plane, helicopter, or submarine is obviously a lot different, to say nothing of learning how to do everything else besides moving it. Indeed that's why humanoid suits or robots have an appeal, they are likely to be quicker to learn and master, particularly since they'd probably have civilian equivalents for industry, like the exoskeleton we see Ripley using in the Aliens film, which would seem a lot more effective than a forklift or for sports for that matter, amusingly, in the future, kids might be donning such suits for their Little League games, same as we have them don protective gear now. So you have to invest a lot of time into training someone before they can be useful, and you have to do the same for folks back home supplying the gear and funds to make and buy it. The tipping point for whether or not to increase your army size during a major conflict is whether or not the typical person assists the war more by being in direct conflict or home producing stuff, 
Can they produce more warfighting gear staying back in factories or contributing to the general economy than being removed from that economy for military training and deployment? A blacksmith forging swords is a lot more valuable to you doing that than swinging one, so it's not a new concept by any means, but modern technology has very complex supply chains that tend to make it advantageous to use few troops with tons of top-notch gear and train them heavily. Indeed we often narrow things further by having military vehicles with very large maintenance teams but only a handful of crew or even a single pilot. Though a billion dollar supersuit that lets one guy equal the value of a hundred is still a poor investment, particularly if it needs a big maintenance crew too, unless your economy is so potent that a hundred guys can produce a billion dollars to pay for that supersuit. I should also note that improvements in automated production and 3D printing could flip that dynamic backwards, requiring few people to build and maintain the gear, but at the moment elite, well-trained, and equipped troops seems to be the best approach. Elite professional soldiers is hardly a new thing, but the general trend in more recent times has been to invest more to quality over quantity, of people anyway. We add to their battlefield quality by enhancing the quantity of the firepower available and the precision of its usage. In that regard, while the really big humanoid robot suits would be hard to justify, the sorts of power armor we see on folks like Tony Stark in Iron Man, or the larger but fairly humanoid exoskeletons like the Dreadnought from Warhammer 40k, are not unreasonable and I expect we'll see those in common use within a decade or two of someone cracking the power supply issue. I would tend to bet the first version of these would feature a modestly large battery and a big cable running back to a generator on whatever vehicle they used for transport. We do actually have atomic generator designs that are very high powered and compact, but that's not really ideal for incorporation into something someone would wear. Though I could easily imagine a robotic equivalent of knights and men-at-arms and squires popping up for a time too. Having a guy in power armor who is followed around by a cadre of robots who carry generators, replacement cable to link to that armor, extra ammo, sensors, and great big hulky metal shields would not require huge amounts of advanced artificial intelligence and automation but still lets you put a well-trained and intelligent person right on the ground for tactical control. A droid nearby with an atomic generator and power cables that trots along with you is fairly viable, though you wouldn't want it trotting too close to you, and all that radiation shielding would make it a pretty tough droid too. You can minimize the issues of the cord tangling you up, and so long as you have a battery good enough for brief operation if the cord breaks, you should be good. Plugging a new power line wouldn't be any trickier or disruptive than reloading a fresh magazine. That's one alternative to increasing the firepower at the disposal of that soldier instead of just enlarging the suit to some giant war mecha, you give them a squad of automatons they can control. Of course this whole concept is mostly about limiting your own casualties, and while that sounds good on first glance, it's not your actual first priority for a war, winning is and a commander that forgets that can be nearly as ineffective as one who throws their forces at the enemy like they have infinite reserves. Ignoring the ethics of that, it's just inefficient. Even if you are using disposable battle droids, you want to spend them frugally. Which raises a point for our last example. If you've got some cadre of droids with your power armor knight, do you actually even need that guy? And if you do, does he need to be on site or just remote control drones instead? Military hardware and doctrine change with technology, so I'd expect to see phases where each of these approaches was used. That cadre of automata accompanying an armored soldier might be the preferred arrangement while artificial intelligence is still crude or not entirely trusted. That lone trooper can control them most of the time well enough, even in combat in a pinch, but they could be augmented by remote pilots who can assume direct control when necessary. If the control signals are jammed, the drones would have their own simple software for basic tasks. More sophisticated software upgrades might automate more complex tasks, even combat, 
and eventually replace the remote pilot, but not yet the human on the ground. At that point we hit an impasse where the armored human directing the drones is the most vulnerable part of the system. He is essentially a tough shell with a gooey interior, and it's time to consider replacing the goo. The good news is that in the age of advanced robotics, the technology to create an android body and enable a human to control it is pretty much the same technology that goes into prosthetics. Instead of putting fragile humans into suits of armor, it would be more practical to ask some soldier who has already been killed but whose brain is more or less intact if they would like a second life as a giant weaponized cyborg, same as we see in Robocop or the Dreadnoughts of 40k. And this gets us back into the bigger mecha, because whether you cyborg someone up or just put them in a combat android with a direct brain interface, there's no longer any reason the mech needs to be human sized. In a lot of the older fiction like the Battletech or Mech Warrior franchise, the pilot usually messed around with various buttons and joysticks while sitting in a cockpit just like they would in a modern vehicle, but that's fairly unlikely to ever be the case. Remember, while humanoid shape isn't really ideal for combat, the one great advantage it has is intuitive control, which you lose if you're tugging on sticks and levels so you probably wouldn't build giant humanoid mecha unless you had cyborgs or direct brain interfaces. I was always rather fond of the Battletech franchise and tabletop game, partially because it was a rare example of science fiction that remembered that heat dissipation is a big issue with technology and combat, but I noticed fairly early on, when we got a supplement for adding tanks and artillery instead of big humanoid robots to our games, that those tended to be a lot cheaper and more effective and probably what actually got me thinking on this topic originally and likely influenced me going into artillery when I later joined the army. And artillery, of course, is one of the things that killed off big unit formations of infantry. Standing far back and lobbing tons of ordnance at people is very effective, and the principal reason artillery and bombers aren't used almost exclusively in warfare these days is that most of it is low intensity and asymmetric warfare. You have a lot more accuracy at close range and also typically don't want to blow up towns you occupy or intend to occupy, and if the firepower is very one-sided, your enemies either try to ambush you at fairly close ranges and in places where you're constrained about how much firepower you can bring to bear, or they lead very short careers. This works against the really big robot approach for several reasons. First, weapons are getting a lot more precise and long range, especially in terms of where the trigger man needs to be, since the weapon might be on a drone far away from the pilot, much like how a drone can be piloted by someone far away. Part of the reason for a great big robot is to mount a great big gun, and you don't really need a giant cannon if it's very precise, or the bullet is self-propelled or if all you carry is a little targeting reticle that aims for a giant cannon far away, much like modern Ford Observers for artillery. Even using that power armored lone trooper with robot cadre example from a bit ago, odds are most of the weight on his suit is protective armor and the big guns would be on his droids. The second reason is the robot is handy for close quarter stuff, same reason infantry is, but combat pretty much only ever happens at closer ranges if one side wants to negate the other's advantages in firepower, so you aim to ambush people inside urban areas where they can't see you till you're close and can't cut loose with artillery volleys and air support, both because those might hit their own people and would certainly inflict lots of civilian casualties and property damage. Great big mecha the size of buildings are generally hard to hide being a lot more vertical than something of equal mass and firepower like a tank, which also doesn't have arms and legs sticking out that need a lot more armor and a lot more hydraulics and power to move them once armored. Therefore, they are a lot easier to target with big guns and more vulnerable to small guns, and will be smashing up the real estate too. In the old Robotech cartoons we get a lot of examples of the pilots smashing up the cities they fight in and supposedly protect, and that's a common feature of a lot of giant robot series. I think that's the working assumption for why they so often use swords, beyond that they look cool of course, it cuts down on collateral damage, which is certainly true, 
considering any gun on something about the size of a building isn't going to just be an upsized regular gun. You'd have reached the point where the bullets could just be small atomic bombs instead. Even before then, they shouldn't just be big slugs but various rockets with guidance packages, both because they can carry a payload and steer themselves, and because you can just shoot a bunch at once. Volley fire is how you overwhelm a point defense system, everything comes in at once. A normal gun, regardless of rate of fire, which they can presumably match, is one bullet at a time, even if that time is milliseconds. Sometimes we see logical reasons in sci-fi for reverting to melee combat, like the personal shields in Dune that could repel basically anything, but had to be tuned to let people move and breathe in them, so were vulnerable to slow attacks. So you could fight someone up close and personal, and the obvious method of adjusting the threshold speed for penetration, as needed, doesn't work so well in a setting that forbids computers, so no rapid or smart automatic adjustments of the shields. Still a hand wave though, as we never see anyone wearing armor under their shield for stopping knives, even though we know they have levitation technology that could make that armor lighter. Anyway, the main problem is that while swinging around a big chunk of metal would absolutely do a lot less collateral damage than opening up with giant machine guns, rocket volleys, or atomic weapons, the main reason it will do less damage is because you'll never get a chance to swing it. Your opponent will have blown you to smithereens before you got close. That is the first rule of warfare after all, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And it won't be some weird ridiculous duel, since you wouldn't hold one right in the middle of valuable real estate, and your respective commanders are likely to ask you to dismount from your incredibly expensive war machines and fight with normal swords instead of banging up the multi-million dollar hardware. And if you do have both disputants in a conflict, subscribing to a policy of duels as some way of settling conflicts with minimum losses, they are bound to have training simulators, and those could let both of them fight without damaging property, civilians, valuable war machines, or valuable pilots. Of course all the mechanical and engineering issues with a giant human aren't an issue in VR, but if you're taking that approach to conflicts, essentially proxy combat through games, there's no real reason to use big machines anyway. We do however have four good excuses to use big war robots, three of which apply to principally humanoid ones, so we'll close out by covering those. The first actually is the dual excuse. It's not a very good one but people do like to see fights, they like ones that seem decidedly human in form, and they prefer to see contests live rather than on screen, so great big robots fighting in an arena does actually seem plausible and needless to say wouldn't involve shooting the other guy with an atomic machine gun. And if you live in a fairly warlike culture, it's not completely implausible you'd have a lot of rules meant to minimize how often your cities and planets got trashed. Given that you'll always do better with something you're practiced at and is part of your culture, that could maybe make these a common platform. However, that intuitive control aspect of the humanoid option, our second good excuse, also is handy if you've got really good automation and are fairly peaceful rather than warlike, since you could rapidly build tons of such machines and dump relatively untrained people in them. So that's your third excuse for humanoid mecha. If you've got real cheap construction, flooding the battlefield with tons of giant war machines piloted by folks with minimal training is likely to still be pretty effective plus it's likely to be easier to get them to practice as the entire reason we even contemplate such machines is they sound so cool to pilot. The last one though isn't limited just to humanoid forms, one advantage bigger war machines have is that you can armor everything a lot better. As we've mentioned before in this series, the square cube law means that you can get away with thicker armor the bigger you get, and a lot more redundancy of most components so your war machine can just take way more punishment than not just individual smaller ones but possibly more than an equal mass of those smaller ones, who also have a lot more pilots who would be killed each time one got broken. Even if that bigger one required more crew to run effectively, like the multiple pilots we see in the big Martian Titans of Warhammer 40k, they enjoy a lot more protection. Bigger is better, 
with the exception of when being small though, that you avoid getting hit so much. That's a major advantage, but the problem is that in the future, weapons aren't likely to miss much, and that causes a major shift in how you want to fight. If the enemy's fire never goes wide and can't be dodged, you need to blow it up before it hits you, point defense, or absorb that hit, and for both of those it's likely to be advantageous to go big. However, that doesn't necessarily mean humanoid, and indeed you want to keep to blockier and compact forms, least surface area, though that might be debatable for deflecting fire or if your big limitation is heat dissipation. But I suspect that intuitive control plus heat dissipation won't equal out to compact shapes with more armor covering your sensitive gear even thicker, particularly since it's so likely you could either train folks to use that less intuitive form or create something that it was intuitive for, either a classic artificial intelligence or just the militant version of a smart self-driving car, or something more organic in nature or form, and we'll talk more about living vehicles later this spring when we get to space whales and bioships. Also a good reminder, a culture that has things as smart as humans that it can use instead of humans has to deal with the more dilemma of whether or not those unmanned automatons are actually unmanned. We'll talk about that more in Bioships too. However, while a machine as smart as a human but optimized to that war machines in human physiology would be advantageous for operating it, they wouldn't include the advantage of cutting down on casualties that unmanned machines have. Amusingly though, while we probably won't ever see lines of people at the recruiters waiting to pilot a giant mecha, the parking lot at the recruiters might be rather full, since they might recruit everyone's car and automated vehicles to plug into those military vehicles when wars break out. Sadly, while I can see a lot of power armor and smaller exoskeletons of humanoid form in the future, especially if we overcome the technical challenges discussed in Portable Power and Planetary Invasions, I still can't see a good enough reason for human-piloted and human-shaped giant war robots in the future, but the cases may be a little stronger for them than we first thought. On the other hand, it would be really awesome to pilot one, and as we regularly say in regard to technologically advanced civilizations, they often don't need any better justification for doing something than, because we can. So maybe one day we will get to see them in real life. So we were talking about how in general this concept of piloting a giant war robot tends to be more practical in fiction than reality, and that we don't see too many examples of it in novels since they lose the visual aspect. There are some exceptions, usually where there's already a visual medium to expand off of, like tabletop miniature games, and a lot of those have expanded universes of novels, as do a lot of pen and paper RPGs, video games, and of course film franchises like Star Wars, which is what popularized the term Expanded Universe, to refer to a lot of the novels written by many different authors in a single, shared setting. There was quite a few authors, including some of my favorites, who either got their start writing in shared settings or specialized in it and written for many different ones. One of my personal favorites is Michael Stackpole, who's probably best known for his Star Wars X-Wing series that gave us a look into Rogue Squadron. Before that though, he was one of the early authors central to flushing out the Battletech series, which expanded from being a tabletop game into a collectible card game, an animated show, the well-known MechWarrior video game franchise, and of course the novels and audio performances. I tend to feel a lot of authors for shared settings don't get the recognition they deserve, considering how many of us have whole shelves full of novels from these settings that have influenced, inspired, and entertained us, and given today's topic, I can't think of a better series that explores the concepts of Mecha better and tries to look at it in a practical and serious way. So our audiobook of the month goes to Michael Stackpole's Blood of Kerensky Trilogy, an abridged audiobook collection on Audible. It's a personal favorite, a good place to start with the series, and a great dip back into early 90s space opera nostalgia, and if you enjoy it, you will have no shortage of other works. That's one of the best parts about expanded universes and shared settings, 
The sheer amount of material and lore that each has created for it make the settings feel that much more real. That's doubly the case for the Battletech series, as while it's set a thousand years in the future, it simultaneously feels fantastic and down to earth. You can pick up a free copy of the Blood of Kerensky collection today, just use my link in this episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500 to get a free book and a 30 day free trial, and that book is yours to keep, whether you stay on with Audible or not. And if you don't enjoy the book, you can exchange it for another book, no questions asked. Next week we'll be returning to the Earth 2.0 series to examine Matrioska worlds, many layered, concentric shells to live on with vastly more living area than regular planets, and a type of megastructure Earth itself might be converted into one day. The week after that, we'll be revisiting the concept of spaceships powered by a black hole and see how this sort of drive system may be far superior to others we've looked at and might be something our early interstellar ships use, not something of far distant futures and science fiction. We'll also follow that episode up, down the road, with a look at colonizing black holes as well as weaponizing black holes. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. You can also support future episodes by donating to the channel at our website, isaacarthur.net, or on Patreon. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.